Okay, so apologies for the delay, but finally getting around to doing the 2000 mile review of the Vos 300 rally. It was a bike that was loaned to be by the importer MotoGB here in the UK. They were previously importers of, of Royal Enfield, but since Royal Enfield decided to do it themselves, uh, they picked up the Vos brand from Lex Moto. Uh, and I already knew the guys at MotoGB, so they, they just got in touch to say, do you want to borrow a, a Vos 300 rally just to, to try, which I obviously did. Uh, and I said to them, I've got the upcoming Stella Alpina trip, which is going to be about 2,000 miles down to the Italian Alps. Would it be okay to use it for that? So they said yes, and I guess it was quite a, a brave move for them. It's, a, a, I guess, an untested bike, certainly in the UK market. So potentially a lot to go wrong with a 2,000 mile road trip down to the Alps and then some trail riding whilst uh, down there. There are about 20 of us in total all on all sorts of bikes, mainly in this A2 category. So Honda CRF uh, 300Ls and uh, rallies, also a 250L, 390 KTM Adventures, GS310, a KTM 890 Adventure, quite a few Himalayans, uh, an old DR350 and uh, I think a 1200 GS as well. So a bit, a bit of everything, but it was going to be a great opportunity to test the Vogue in an environment that was adventurous and also against its peers that it was obviously hoping to compete against. For anybody who doesn't know too much about the Vogue, it's, it's a 300cc single cylinder, liquid cooled, 29 brake horsepower, almost like a direct rival alternative to a Honda CRF 300 Rally. The interesting point is that it costs £3,799 plus on the road, which makes it about £4,000, which is £2,500 less than the Honda. And then you also get in uh, the hang guards, the engine guards and the rear rack as standard. Um, so quite an interesting value proposition. And that's, I guess, where I was really interested in. Could this be a good bike at a good par price and therefore actually get, gain some traction, much like the Himalayan did? The Himalayan did the exact same thing. It offered a good package at a good price. And as a result, it sold. So I think everyone was w is wondering whether the Vogue can do a similar thing. The route that we were going to take down there, we had eight days to get down there and do some riding and then get back. So quite, a, I guess, a hurried trip for small CC bikes. As a result, we were going to take the uh, non-motorway route to get down there. So two days to get down there, four days down there, and then two days to get back. For me in North Devon, the route itself involved about 250 miles across to New Haven, where we caught the, the ferry, the DFDS ferry to, to Dieppe. And then we did 250 miles down to a place called Avalon, stayed in a, a nice little hotel there. Most of the trip was camping, but that, for that first night, as we were going to have a night on the ferry and then 250 miles riding, there was a good affordable hotel in Avalon, so we stayed there. And then the next night we rode down, uh, really just nice back road riding, not too busy, a few, a few busier towns, but nothing too major until we got into the foot of the Alps and we stayed at a campsite at the foot of Mont Blanc. It was called the Mont Blanc Plage Campsite. And it was an absolutely spectacular little spot. They had a sw swimming uh, lake and food by the lake, and but not expensive, a little bit down on its look, I suppose, but a really good stop-off point with a great view and a great place to swim. So a really nice place for the group to come together. And then the next day, the plan was to ride down into the Alps uh, via these twisty roads here, which you can see. I don't know the names of them, but this was a route I followed. And down to Val there, and then down, 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 down to Lake Chenis, which is where a lot of the fortress roads are. So we were going to do some of the fortress uh, roads, which are dirt track riding up into the, the old, I guess, Napoleon or early First World War forts around here, Pata Cruza, Vericell, and then there's one up here as well. So we were going to do these, that was the plan. Uh, for anybody who's watched previous videos, we did have the incident uh, with Richard just before here. So it kind of disrupted, I guess, the plan or changed the plan. So uh, just bear in mind that what some of what I intended to do didn't quite happen because we had a rider uh, in hospital. So we rode down and then we had three nights down at Camp uh, Grand Bosco Camping Lodge, which was a great place to base ourselves for three nights to do the... Um, Stella Alpina, which is here, the coldest sommelier, sommelier, which is, so it's a long dirt road up to the top. So whilst we were down there, we'd also have time to do a couple of routes I've planned, uh, Fort Jeffreau, and across that route there, which is all dirt track riding, and there's the road up to the top of the Stella Alpina, the cold sommelier, and then the next day, 
on another day I'd also got a route planned which would allow us to do, do the the Col de Finestra and Asieta. Sorry about that, it's just vanished, which is all through this region here, which is again all dirt road riding and a, a fantastic place to ride a motorcycle, certainly a, a, a trail bike. So a big test for the Vogue really, because at this, right after that trip we obviously had to, let me show you where to do the trip back, which was a slightly uh, more southerly route. We went through the Vacours, which was a spectacular route, we did the Col de Ma Machina, I think it is, which is a high balcony road, and then again two days to get back. So all in all 2,000 miles. So a really good test for the Vosges. You know, can it travel on the motorway? Can it travel on A-roads? Can it do the trail road riding? Is it reliable? Is it enjoyable to ride? And does it fit the purpose that you bought it for, i.e. adventure? Uh, I didn't do anything to the bike. The bike was completely stock, uh, apart from a cool cover seat cover that I put on for comfort. And then I just got these cheap throwover bags from Amazon, about 120 pounds, nine, nine liters either side. And then with a standard rear rack, I was just able to put a dry well, bag testing, on there. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. Here. So about 20 kilos loaded up. I'm about 85, 86 kilos uh, with biking gear on. So a combined weight of about 110 kilos. Didn't have to change the suspension and didn't have to do anything to the bike, just basically set off. The bike had done 90 miles when I did depart, so technically still needed running in and I've since read that the running pr procedure is, is uh, 300 miles at no more than 45 miles per hour which obviously this bike did not get. It got a bit of a thrashing down to the ferry, really bad weather, a lot of rain uh, and also obviously because I was in a haste I just stuck on the motorways to get down to New Haven for the ferry. So the first test for it was, was the motorway, how does it perform on the motorway? I'd read previously that the engine was buzzier than the CRF and it didn't like high revs and from the first few miles I could tell yeah that's a pretty good summary and I think the reason for that is the gearing it's quite low geared so it's it's been geared more for the trails than it has for the motorway so it's running almost a one for one um, speed to uh, miles per hour to revolution i.e at 60 miles an hour it's doing about 6,000 rpm a little bit over at 70 miles an hour it's doing about 7,250 rpm so it is quite a high revving bike and you can feel that when you when you get going you can think well oh, it's a bit tingly through the bars it's a bit buzzy on the top side of 60 you do settle into it and I did about two and a half mile, two and a half hours of riding before I needed to stop to put fuel in, starting to get a bit tingly fingers. So I think certainly those initial fee that initial feedback that I got about the engine that it's a little bit buzzy on the motorway is true. Although I think that could be softened by putting on a taller gearing. And I've since read on the forums that people are doing that, either either a bigger sprocket on the front or a couple down on the rear just to relax its revs at the top end and therefore probably increase its cruising speed or allow you to cruise at similar speeds with the engine less revy, less positive, which I think would be a good thing for people who are commuting on it or doing more A-road, fast road uh, riding. Otherwise the bike was fine, it's very stable on the motorway, uh, it, the screen seems to work, the bike seems settled, it would hold 70 miles an hour in the middle lane and 75 if you pushed into the outside lane. It was happier at 65, but I guess all these bikes are but it would sit at 70, would sit at 75 if needed. I think what's immediately telling about the bike's suspension, and when I compared the bike in the vi previous video of the CRF to the Vogue, is that the Vogue does sit much flatter, i.e. the rear suspension is less soft than on the CRF. So yes, the seat height is taller, but it means on the road it sits neutrally front to rear, which for me makes it feel much more balanced. I think the CRF can feel that you're that you dragging the rear a little bit, and I know that can be remedied by, up, by uprated shocks, but out of the crate with luggage on, I think the Vogue took the luggage much better than the CRF did, and as a result, gave me better stability on the motorway, and therefore I didn't feel like I was on a small, underwhelming bike. It, the bike seems to have presence because you sat quite tall, and also you've got the screen. I think from a seating position, the bike feels like a, a perfect split between an L a CRF 300L and a Rally. It's not got quite the, the amount of plastics and bulbous tank of the Rally, but it's not as slender as the L. It's also got the fixed headlight like the Rally. So I think they've, they've actually created a nice bike that sits in between the slender trail bike of the L and the more adventurous uh, appeal of the, of the Rally. It's sort of, from a size perspective or slenderness perspective, the Vogue sits nicely between L and Rally. Miles per gallon on this long, fast 
Motorway stretch about 65 miles to gallon, which is about on par with Himalayan, probably touch less than CRF, I would have thought. I mean, that was holding it quite at high speed, and also that gearing meant that the engine was working quite hard. So obviously, increase the gearing and you might get a bit better efficiency. But I arrived down to the ferry at New Haven, the DFDS, which I wouldn't recommend because it just seemed a poor service compared to Brittany Ferries or Stena Line. Um, we took the overnight ferry to Dieppe. But that 250 mile ride on the Vosges, I was impressed with it. It was as I expected from the engine and it was probably better than I expected from the way it sat on the road and, and, and rode as a machine. The brakes were a little bit underwhelming. I think uprated pads would improve its stopping power. It lacks a bit of feel front and uh, rear. Uh, it's not too bad a thing because obviously on a, on a softly sprung bike, you don't want anything that bites too hard but I probably would like a little bit more, more bite than what it uh, does, has, does have. On the A-Rose through France, doing 55, 60 miles an hour, and this is the thing, you know, doing the back rows on these kind of bikes, it's, it's a perfect leveller because the speed limit is 80 kilometers an hour, which is only 50 miles an hour, and all of these bikes, whether it's a 310GS or a KTM 390 Himalayan CRF, they all will sit at 55, 50 miles an hour, absolutely all day long, no problem at all. Uh, and as a result, the bike started to get about 95 miles per gallon. So actually, the uh, and they're all about the same. So in a sense, if you're avoiding the motorway, all these small bikes actually really suit the, the A-road riding down through rural France. People jump on the motorway to avoid rural France. Personally, I, I thought it added a lot to the trip because rural, rural France is quite enchanting. I like the little villages. I like the bakeries that you can stop at, tabacs, the, the tobacconists which do the coffee. So I thought it added to the experience and you see some places that you would otherwise have rushed past in haste if you were to take the motorway. No different if you were to arrive, say, in Dover and we're heading for Scotland, you could jump on the motorway and get to Scotland in a day, but equally you could go through the Peak District and the Lake District and all those other places. So I would say if you can factor in uh, a back road ride through France, it adds to the atmosphere of getting down to the Stella Alpina or down to the Alps. It adds a day, but I think it adds much more in terms of what you get uh, from that. Again, bike absolutely fine. A few little niggles I found. The fuel cap, the key doesn't stay in the fuel cap. So you undo the fuel cap, you lift the cap up with the key and the cap falls off the key and hits the ground and, and just chips the cap. So be careful of that if you are use, when you are using the fuel cap for the first time. Hold on to the cap as well as to the key. One of the things I picked up on, on the first ride is that it's rated for E5 fuel only, which in France wasn't an issue at all. It was easy to get E5. The bike ran fine on that. I did try on the way down a couple of tanks of E10. It didn't seem to impact it at all. Just since then, I have run it a few times on E10 in the UK, and I did notice it, it can stall sometimes on a closed throttle downhill. It sort of flames out. So I don't think you're going to notice any real big running differences if you run it on E10, but there are those little times when... Obviously, he's not running as efficiently or as well as it should be on E5. So you, if you can run it on E5 rather than E10, do so. In France, it was no problem at all getting E5. In the UK, in Cornwall, for example, it has been quite tricky. So I, I don't know what damage, is, if any, it's doing long-term by running it on E10. I probably don't think it's doing any damage. It's, the engine is just not running at its best or its finest uh, when you run it on E10 over E5. Will it get you to wherever you want to go on E10? Yes, absolutely. Will you notice any difference in performance? No. Will it make a few times when it might stall out? It, in my case, it, it did. As we hit the mountains, I think what where the bike came into its own or where it performed much better than I expected to was in the corners. The suspension is not, I guess it, it's just basic suspension. It, there's nothing overly complex to it or, or advanced. It's a budget, budget setup, but they've set it up very well. So the bike sits very neutral. Yes, it does dive under braking a little bit, but all long travel suspension bikes do. But because the bike sits neutral, it always feels stable and adjustable in the corners. And therefore, I could ride the bike as aggressively as I probably wanted to, and the bike responded well to that. And I think that's different to, say, a CRF or even a 310GS in the fact that those bikes are, up and, are good up until about seven-tenths of your pace. But if you want to push beyond that, the suspension starts to let those bikes down. I felt with the Vosges, I could ride the wheels off it, or at least try to, and the bike never suggested that it, didn't, it wasn't happy at that. The, the, the suspension always behaved itself. It always sat well in the corners and allowed me to really lean on the tyre and get good traction and good grip and good drive out of a corner. I was having fun on the twisty roads on the Vosges, 
perhaps in a way that I maybe wouldn't have been on a, a CRF. So I think the stock suspension on those twisty rows actually worked really well. Something else that really worked really well on the twisty climbing rows was the gearing, which might be a bit low geared, short geared for the motorway, but actually in the climbs it was perfect because it would hold, on the twisting hairpins, instead of having to come down to second, which you'd probably do on a Himalayan or, or a CIF, it would hold third and it would pull through a corner cleanly and the fueling's really good, really smooth and, smooth and progressive, so you can sort of roll on the throttle without that sense of, you know, the, the fuel coming, cutting back in. Just a really nice progressive feel, and you could hold third rather than going down a second, which gave the bike a lot more flexibility to accelerate and keep pace through a corner. So the gearing actually came into its own on the climbs. So uh, with all things, it's a compromise. Yes, you could change the gearing for the motorway, but then you'd probably make it less rideable, drivable, in the corners so uh you're not sure maybe the answer is what honda have done is put sort of a, a tall six gear in the crf to relax it on the highway but keep the gear in pretty much the same from first to fifth uh, and maybe that's what Vogue could look to do further down the line just to just to give it that flexibility of being good in the tight stuff but also long and leggy on the open road but yes in the in the corners in these tight twisting alpine rows i was really enjoying the Vogue. i thought it's got a nice upright sitting position the bars are nice and wide those brakes do work well enough as long as you use a back brake as well as a front and into the corners and out of the corners the bike flowed really nicely and i could ride it as aggressively as perhaps i wanted to to do so and i could get away from faster bike uh faster riders on faster bikes simply for the way that it cut its way through corners so it gave me a lot of confidence and I think I was impressed by that. It also held 94, 95 MPG through this section. So I, it was hard to find fault. The engine is a KLX Kawasaki 300, Kawasaki KLX 300 uh, replica built by Launchin, who built the bike. Uh, is that an exact replica or built on license from Kawasaki? There's no clarity on that. My suspicion being is that Launchin build engines for BMW, which make them an established reputable engine builder and therefore bike builder would they copy by deceit a kawasaki engine i think that's unlikely and if they did i think they're capable of building it or copied it very well I, i've got a suspicion more likely is that kawasaki have been using launching to build the engines for the klx 300 and the part of this agreement a bit like ktm and cf motor is that launching can use the engine to build their own stuff which raises a question why did kawasaki never build or use this engine to be, build a klr 300 a CRF 300 rally competitor because that's all this bike effectively is. is. The Vogue is a KLR 300. That's how I, I see it. It's, it's what would have happened if Kawasaki had attempted to take on the CRF 300 rally. Instead, it's been built by launching in China and coming at a lesser price. So I probably don't think it's a bad thing that Kawasaki never built it because what we've got is in some ways, maybe in ways better. Who knows? But that engine works well it likes to rev it's clean revving it's smooth on the pickup the fueling's good it's a bit buzzy at higher revs but that's okay and, and so therefore i think the engine's probably it's, it's, it's a strong point didn't use any oil the exhaust sounds good it's got a right nice pop and crackle to it on the overall so i don't think you're going to need to fit an aftermarket exhaust to it runs a little bit warm at times but only occasionally so from an engine point of view no problems at all. So we got down to the Alps and that's where the Stella Alpina was and where we based ourselves at the Gran Bosco uh, campsite just, just outside Ux on the Italian side of the Alps. Here we've got loads of good trails to ride, you know, miles and miles and miles of them. The Assietta is a long route that took us about four or five hours to ride. It was just an endless track and trail. Because the Stella Alpina was on and because these tracks are only open for say three months of a year, it was a busy weekend. There was a lot of traffic on the on the trails, a lot of motorcyclists, cyclists, 4 by 4 a bit of everything, walkers. So I, what I would say is, if you're desperate to do the Stella Alpina event, go that weekend. But if you're desperate to ride trails when they're not as busy, maybe go a few days after or a few weeks either side for when it might be a bit quieter, maybe in the week. But some great tracks, really kind of novice friendly. You needed a bit of experience, but you didn't certainly didn't need to be a professional to ride these kind of trails. And because they were long, you got into a flow of it and you got a feel for it, and then you got the stunning scenery. So for me, it was a, just a great place to ride 
a trail motorcycle or an adventure motorcycle. You've got some of the long tunnels, you've got some climbs, you've got some mud, you've got some rock, you've got some ice sheets to cross if you wanted it, which some of the guys did. Unfortunately, I never, because of the incident with Richard, who ended up in hospital in Grenoble, I never actually did the Stella Alpina route, but the rest of the group did and had a great time getting up it. I did some of the other riding and it was a great chance to, to put the Vosges through its paces in this environment, in an off-road environment. And again, I guess it was totally predictable how it worked in that in in those conditions. The suspension works well. Sometimes it will top out and bottom out. I think ultimately there was improvements to be made in that suspension if you're going to start riding it fast and start riding it harder. I think good riders are obviously going to find the limit of its suspension quite early on. Um, but I think for novice to moderate riders, the suspension is absolutely going to be fine. And, and, and surprisingly, I sat down for a lot of it. I've never been a sat down rider, but I find that, found the suspension was compliant and absorbent enough. I just sat down because we were doing such long trails. The bike would gobble up that rough terrain and I sat down. I saw guys behind me on Himalayas stood up having to work the bike because of, that's not got as much suspen suspension travel. So you have to use your body as part of that suspension. But the Vogue, I just sat down and it absorbed it and I had a quite a relaxing ride. Power on the throttle is good. That gearing suits the trails. Comfort was all day. Comfort w was good. The tyres worked well enough on the dirt. They were road biased, knobbly, so they worked on the road and worked well enough on the dirt. If it's going to be muddy, you're going to have to fit a knobbly tyre, but that's that's a given. But in those conditions, the bike performed uh, as I expected, exactly as I expected it to to do. The bikes against it's neutral in the dirt, so you can feel like you've got good control of it. I did swap bikes with a CR owner with Dave on a Honda CRF 250L. It was interesting to ride that bike because there's a lot of people, there's been people saying, Why would you buy the Vogue when you would get a you know an eight year old, six year old CRF 250L? Well, having ridden them back to back, I say the reason you get the Vogue is because the engine feels a lot stronger, crisper, gruntier, and meatier, and the suspension doesn't feel as soft and as wallowy as it does on the CRF. So for me, dynamically, the Vogue is a, is a stronger bike than the Honda. Bringing into questions of parts availability, reliability, long-term uh, integrity of the bike, I, you can't answer that. You don't know what a Vogue is going to look like in 20,000 miles time. But to ride the bikes back to back, the Vogue dynamically was a, it was almost a no-brainer. It was a no-brainer, a, a more enjoyable bike to ride. You could ride it at a faster pace and with, with more um, attitude, than you could the, the, the eight year old, six year old CRF. I think it'd be close to gap riding it back to back with the CRF, but until I do that back to back test here in the UK, I can only guess, but I would think that the Vogue is still dynamically a little bit more aggressive, a bit more taut in the chassis than a CRF, certainly with stock suspension. You could have to market the suspension on the CRF and it'd probably improve again, leapfrog the Vogue, but if we're talking stock bikes, I think for in terms of dynamic control and ability and progressive riding, the Vogue crate is a stronger bike than the CRF, which will upset some, but that's that's how I feel, that's how I that's how I see it, that's how I saw it. So that was really good riding. I'd certainly recommend this type this riding down here to, to anybody who wants to spend a good few days enjoying long continuous riding on man, in manageable terrain with amazing scenery. It really was, and it was a great test of all the bikes in fairness. Now, I, I think with these reviews, you're always looking to pick a better bike or pick a winner. But, but uh, the conclusion from this ride out was that whatever bike people went down on or had chosen to go down on, whether it's the 310GS, the CRF, the KTM 390 Adventure, the Himalayan, all those riders found all their bikes perfectly capable of doing the terrain and the riding that we set out to do. None of them complained about their bikes in any capacity. They didn't in any way say they were underwhelmed or inadequate on their bikes. None of them said that they would have swapped them for other bikes. And I think that what that suggests is that this class of bikes is perfectly capable and in many ways perfect for this type of adventure. There's this notion that you need more bike, more power, more performance, more price, more technology, which was the conclusion that MCN came to in the magazine from the four bike test that I did with them recently. You know, that this class of bikes is inadequate, they're underwhelming, therefore go up a grade, get a Tenere 700. All these guys on these bikes that I took down to the Stella Alpina, benefited from being on this size of bike. It enabled them to go off and explore without the worry of the weight of a bigger bike or the complexity or the speed or the power. These softer, lower, lighter 
more manageable A2 class bikes of adventure bikes were the enablers of their adventure. So I would say if you are wanting to do this type of riding, go smaller rather than bigger. And whether you took the Honda CRF or the KTM or the Vosges or, or the GS, those riders were happy on them and they found that they were capable of doing road and trail, no problems at all. Obviously some were better at one thing than another. The KTM and the BMW were probably a little bit better on the road than the CRF and the Vosges. But then on the trails, the Vosges and the CRF were a little bit better than the GS and the 390. You know, the, there's always going to be something that's a little bit better than the other one thing. But they all did it and they all impressed their riders. And all the riders came away happy with the choice of bike that they'd taken on that journey. And it was a great, it was a great reminder that these bikes, although the trip looks big and the engine seems small, if you do it right and you do it in a way that suits the size of the bike, they're a perfect bike for, for this kind of adventure. As Ichi Boots is proving by going around the world on a CRF, you, know, you don't need to look any further than her to, sh to see what these bikes are capable of. As for the Vogue, I came back very happy with the bike. I'm more, I was enamoured with the bike. I put a lot of stress on that bike during that trip. I had to do dashes to the hospital. It had a long stretch on the motorway from Grenoble back to the Alps at high speed. I needed a bike that was reliable, that was dependable, that was faithful for quite an arduous journey that it was tasked with, and it performed faultlessly. There's no way I could criticise the bike. There is no way, there are very few ways I would improve it bar that gear and if you could just make sixth a bit taller. But as a test of a machine, it passed the test absolutely with flying colours. Can I ask question, answer questions of what it's going to be like in 20,000 miles or can I get parts in three years time for it? I don't know the answer to those questions. But all I can say is that for this journey, the bike was perfect and it was rival to its peers. Since I've got back from that trip, I've took a group around the Southwest 500, which is a Cornish and Devon trip, all on road. And again, I come back from that trip really impressed with the bike. It's got spirit, it's got bite in its engine, and it's got a tenacity to ride at a faster pace, which rewards me as a rider because it allows me to ride a pace that I, I, I tend to ride at. And the bike has done it. It's comfortable, it's reliable, it's, it's, it does the job. It's a bike that does the job. So if you're on the fence about buying one, I can never say you must go out and buy one, but I'd certainly say if you're considering one, you must go out and look at one and at least get a test ride because I think it's a really good, worthy addition to this sector of the market. It brings a bike which offers everything you need straight out of the crate. You don't need to spend any money on it. It's, it's ready to go. It's a ready-to-go adventure bike, much like the Himalayan was. And it comes in at a price which is just a no-brainer option. There are slight niggles. The servicing intervals of 3,000 uh, 3, miles are annoying and I think if it was my bike I would self-service eventually. That's a niggle and it would it would balance out the price differential a little bit. Uh, there's a little bit of rust and surface rust appearing on the exhaust header so there's a, there could be a slight issue with some of the finish over time. Some of the fasteners have started to go a bit furry already. So is it a premium product? Probably not. Does it ride well? Yes. So I think there's always going to have to be this realisation you're going to have to deal with some misgivings of the bike but then we've done that with the Himalayan and we've done that with all the bikes in this class you know none of the bikes in this class are perfect and the Vogue mirrors that by not being perfect either but it's four thousand pounds so uh, I think you have to accept a little bit of financial reality or manufacturing reality that you can't build a perfect bike and sell it for four thousand pounds it's just up to you whether you decide that those little quirks niggles faults whatever are worth the gain in having a, a dynamically capable trail machine that can do road and dirt in equal measure. So, in conclusion, if you want in a simple conclusion, I think the Vogue is a very good bike. Would I buy one myself? Absolutely. I wouldn't hesitate to buy one if I, and I would actually, heaven forbid, buy one over a Himalayan because I, I think the price is, I think the value is better, £4,000 versus 5000 now for a Himalayan. And also, it's got a bit more verve to its riding. Um, characteristics it likes to be thrashed a little bit more which is a good thing for some people it's not as good at slow speed steady softening riding so if you still want that the Himalayans are still a great bet KTM's still a great road bike GSS 310 is still a great sort of a meandering bike really capable of taking your places without any real effort and the CRF, CRF is, is still a good bike by a reputable brand which will probably never let you down but at a price which I, I find hard to justify now in the face of the Vogue.
for two and a half thousand pounds, what more does it offer? Reputation, you know, is that reputation worth two and a half grand? You're gonna have to decide that, not me. Would you be better getting a one year old CRF? Probably, and saving yourself some money anyway? Yeah, I would think so. Would you get a one year old CRF 300 Rally or a Vosges? Closer, closer, it's a harder argument to, it's a harder question to answer, but at least we have a new contender, a new bike in this class, which is good. And that's, that's a result.